I hope you had a great day in Burgada. How many people got to ride a camel? Did you like that? It was different. We love camels. Camels are great. Uh, we have camel pillows and all kinds of things. So, but I do hope you had a good day here. We are on our way now to up the entire length of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the eastern arm, northeastern arm of the Red Sea. We will. Um, Tomorrow morning, we will come into port early in the port of Aqaba. And I'm going to talk a little bit about Aqaba as a, as a place when I talk about Lawrence of Arabia later on. It'll be after, you know, after we've been there and gone, but it'll give you some idea about the importance of that during the First World War. Um, when we land in Aqaba, the captain mentioned this earlier, if you look over to your left, you're looking at Israel. Uh, because Israel comes to a point there, the city of Elat. Uh, which is uh, part of Israel is there. So if you've never been to Israel, you'll at least have seen it. Um, so, uh, but it's, it's a beautiful area and you'll find out very, very rugged, but very beautiful area. So since we're stopping at Aqaba, the primary reason for that, or the, the sort of prime excursion, there are other things to do as well. There is um, swimming and snorkeling and diving is popular throughout that whole area, as well as the Wadi Rum which is, again, we'll talk about a little bit when we get into Lawrence of Arabia, and you'll get a chance. We're going to be showing the movie Lawrence of Arabia. Um, it's a very long movie. It had an intermission when it first came out, but it won a number of Academy Awards. It's considered one of the best, uh, 10 best movies ever. When I talk about Lawrence of Arabia, right before these, we see the film, I think I can help you understand a few things. Even though it's a very long movie, uh, they had to leave some stuff out in order to, to fit it in. And so I'll help, help you understand that. And of course, it was um, the a spectacular movie. They did say that Peter O'Toole, who stars as T.E. Lawrence, um, brilliant blue eyes. They said if he'd been any prettier, they'd had to have called it Florence of Arabia. <laughs> but we'll have a chance to see that movie as we go on. So now we want to talk about the city of Petra, the lost city of Petra and the Nabataeans, the people who are responsible for this extraordinary place. I will tell you right up front, the Smithsonian Institute has said that Petra is one of the 28 places you must see before you die. The BBC is listed as one of the top 40 locations to visit in the world, and it is listed as one of the seven new wonders of the ancient world. The reason that they had a seven new wonders, which includes the Taj Mahal and some other places, and, and Petra, of course, is because all but one of the other wonders of the world are gone, the ancient wonders. Uh, the, the pyramids are the only one that's left. We've lost the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, we've lost the Colossus of Rhodes, and all the rest of that. So, uh, it is an extraordinary sight, and recognized as such. But before we get to talking about the city itself, let's back up a little bit and talk about uh, how we came to find out about this. A man named Johann Ludwig Burkhardt, who was a Swiss explorer, a geographer, what they used to call an orientalist. He was fascinated by all the things Asian. As a very young man, he wanted to be involved in, as an explorer. And this is at the very start. Uh, he was born, as you can see up here, in 1784. The 1800s, or 19th century, was the age of great exploration, especially in Africa, when so many of the areas, that's when they called it the Dark Continent, because there were so many unexplored parts of Africa. They were especially interested in tracing the origins of some of the great rivers, the Nile River, the Zambezi River, and Burkhart, this Swiss young man, was very interested in finding the source of the, Ni of the uh, Niger River. The reason they're focused on rivers is all of the great civilizations almost in, in early history all were built around a river. Of course, Egypt, the Nile, the Tigris and Euphrates were the place where the Mesopotamian or Sumerian um, civilization started. The Indus Valley, if you're staying on till Singapore, I know quite a few of you are, then I'll be doing a talk about the Indus uh, Valley civilization, which they just have found out about in the last hundred years and now believe it's one of the very oldest civilizations ever and even the Yellow River civilization in China. All of them were based around rivers because that gave you not only water, but it gave you the ability to uh, have the, the fertile land and the crops, etc. So he was interested in finding the source of the Niger River. When he was 22 years old, he went to England 
and he had a letter of introduction to uh, Sir Joseph Banks, who was the president of the Royal Society and was a member of the African Exploration Society. They funded and supported exploration in Africa. Sir Joseph Banks agreed to support him. He spent some time to support Burkhart. He spent some time studying Arabic at Cambridge. He then went to Malta and studied for a while at, in Malta, the island of Malta. He believed that the best way for him to be able to explore these areas would be if, since they were Muslim already by this time, is if he could pass as a Muslim, and not just a Muslim, but a Muslim legal scholar. So he wanted to perfect his Arabic, he wanted to perfect his knowledge of the Quran and of, of Islamic law, so he spent time in Malta. On Malta, while he was there, he heard about another explorer who had been murdered along the way, so they didn't have a final report, who had sent back messages that he had found in the area of the Middle East, Arabia, that he had found a lost city. Well, that's all they really knew about it, and just generally where it was. After Malta, Burkhart went to Aleppo in Syria and spent two years being tutored in uh, both Islamic law and further tutoring in Arabic. By the time he was done, and here he's like 25 years old by then, he could pass and did pass not only as uh, Arabic, because his language was so good, but even passed as a Muslim scholar, a legal scholar. So he was pretty impressive. He also had spent a lot of time not only in England, but uh, when he was in the Middle East, he would walk bareheaded in heat waves. He would sleep on the ground. He would eat nothing but vegetables and drink nothing but water in order to toughen himself up because he knew this was going to be hard. So he was a very impressive guy. And as he was traveling around the Middle East and doing some preliminary exploring in the Middle East before he went to Africa to discover the source of the Niger, um, he was traveling from Nazareth down to Cairo, and he had uh, some local locals who thought he was an Arab were talking about this lost city that was not far away. Well, he convinced a local guide, a local Bedouin guide, to take him to this lost city for the purpose, he said, of sacrificing a goat at the tomb of Aaron, which was very close by this city. Aaron, of course, in, uh, biblically, was the brother of Moses, and he is considered uh, a prophet. He's one of the prophets, minor prophets, in the Quran as well. And so he wanted to go and sacrifice there. Well, in the process, he found Petra. Um, in, on August 22nd of 1812, Johann Ludwig Burkhardt, who was going at that point by the name Sheikh Ibrahim ibn Abdallah, not, they didn't know he was a Westerner, he was shown through the Sikh to the ancient lost city of Petra. I say it was lost because no one outside the Bedouin community, no one from the West had heard anything about this city for over 500 years. They didn't, it wasn't on the maps, nobody knew about it, and when you get there, you can see how somebody could miss it if they, weren't, if they didn't know it was there. And so, in 1812, he discovered, rediscovered, as a Westerner, the lost city of Petra. All during this time, because he was being sponsored by the English explorers, the African uh, Society and others, he was sending back reports to England. Uh, unfortunately, Burkhardt did not live too much longer than this, just, just uh, in, in 1817, he ended up, he was in Cairo getting ready to launch the, the effort to find the source of the, of the Niger River, and he suffered for the multiple time, you know, the, the, he, this had happened for him for quite a while, he suffered a severe bout of dysentery and died at 27. But all during this time he'd been sending reports back to England about things he was finding. He also, if you've ever heard of Abu Simbal, if you heard of the site of Abu Simbal, it's a temple um, in built by Ramses II, that's further down river from, um, well, further up river, actually, uh, further south from Luxor. He's the one that discovered Abu Simbal as well. Um, even though he's a very young man, he was very busy. Died at 27, and then all these reports, early on in uh, the uh, 1822, I think, was the point at which they first started, uh, people started coming and following up on his instructions, and all of a sudden, a lot of people were discovering this lost city of Petra, okay? This is the first sight that he would have gotten and the first sight you will get as you walk through the Sikh, this narrow stone canyon. 
I'll give you a little more detail about that as we go along. This building is called the um, Al uh, Kazne, which is the treasury. It's not really a treasury, it was a tomb. This gives you some idea of the scale of things. Here is a Bedouin man standing. This is not Al Kazne, uh, this is the Al Dair, the monastery it's called, which you'll see other pictures of. But you, this is just the capstone. This is just you know, the top part. Um, Al Kazne, for instance, is 82 feet wide and 128 feet tall. All of Petra, none of it was built. All of it was carved out of raw stone. They started with flat, a flat cliff face and started carving, carved out chambers and, and images. There are statues all in relief. This is why, and the, the whole of Petra covers an area that is about 400 square miles. So I know people who think, oh, well, this is it, that's Petra. No, there's a lot more to it. Now, part of that 400 square miles is fairly rugged mountains that's in between because Petra exists, the city exists along these um, sort of canyons through, throughout the area there. But um, all of it, as I say, carved out of stone. Here is one of the people who went in the in, uh, fairly early 1800s was an artist. This is the... The monastery, as it's called, Al Dair, which is up on top of the hill. So, um, this guy standing here, he's standing right there. That gives you some idea. This, the Al Dair, is the largest of the carved buildings there. But it's quite extraordinary um, that you you can find all of this. Again, here's more carvings he did. Now, the people who did this were the Nabataeans. And if you've never heard of Nabataeans, then you're part of a large group of people because most people don't even know about this, even if they've heard about Petra. The Nabataeans were a, uh, a group of people, they were nomads, and for, for most of their existence, they were from down in Arabia. They were a Bedouin people. They were nomadic. Uh, they traveled around. In fact, early on in their history, the Nabataeans were reluctant to live in houses. They didn't want to settle anywhere because they thought if they settled somewhere, then they might you know, they would get sedentary and somebody would take over and rule them, and they had never been ruled by anyone. But what happened historically, there's, there's often domino effects in history. In 586, see if this is the next slide I have, yeah, 586, the, well, 722 BC, the Kingdom of Israel, the Northern Kingdom of Israel, after Israel had been split in two, the Northern Kingdom of Israel was destroyed by the Assyrians and carried off into captivity. Those are the lost tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom of Judah, and I'm going to talk about I want to talk about the uh, birthplace of empires. The southern kingdom of Judah survived the Assyrians, but in 586 the Babylonians, 586 BC, the Babylonians came in, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and carried the, the people of Judah off into captivity. So this area was all unoccupied. Edom, the kingdom of Edom, there was some great areas up in what had been Judah for, uh, for grazing animals. And so Edom, who previously had controlled the area around Petra, now they didn't build it up in the same way, but they controlled that area, they moved north. And when they moved north, these wandering Nabatu or Nabataean tribes moved over and took over the land that Edom had evacuated. And big thumbs, um, they discovered that Petra was easily fortified. And for the first time, they felt like they had found some place. They didn't have to be fearful that someone would attack them and take over. And so they occupied this area when the Edomites had left and moved north. They began to build these extraordinary stone carved buildings in here and created one of the great wonders of the world in the city of Petra. So here are the Nabatu tribes. Um, that had come up from Arabia. Down here, down here is Arabia. Here's another image. As time goes on, here we have the first century. See, this is back um, in around 600 BC. When you get to the first century, you'll notice that the Nabatu tribes are not down here anymore. They reach all the way up here, up until uh, about the, the Lake of Galilee, and all the way around to the Red Sea. They expanded. They became very wealthy because they were traders and they knew how to travel in the desert 
and carry trade from one place to another. Especially, they specialized first in the spices that come from the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, from Yemen and from Oman. When you go to Oman, you will find that's where frankincense and myrrh and a lot of other spices come from. Well, the Nabataeans got very wealthy by knowing how to travel the desert on camels and live in the desert in order to, to carry these spices around. At their height in the first century BC, the Nabataean kingdom was 2.35 million square kilometers. 2,350,000 square kilometers. At that point, they were the largest empire in the world other than the Chinese Empire on the Yellow River, which was about 4 million square kilometers. They were bigger than the Roman Empire at that point. Uh, Greece had begun to decline, and so they were bigger than the Greek Empire. Rome had not yet come into its own, so they were bigger than the Roman Empire. At that point, the Nabataeans controlled more territory than any other people in the world except the Chinese Yellow Valley, uh, or Yellow River group. At this point, they so wealthy, traveled so far, they are known to have traveled to China. At first they were dealing with camels. Later on, they started traveling in the Red Sea, uh, Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea, using dhows. When you get to uh, Kassab in Oman, you will be able, if you want, to take a trip on a dhow and have lunch on a dhow. So you'll see the kind of ships they were using. They have record of them having traveled to China, all over Southern Europe. There is even indications now this would be pretty dramatic if they could really prove it, but some people believe they got as far away as Australia, South America, and North America. Now this is almost 1,500 years before Columbus and 1,000 years before the Vikings supposedly got to North America. But they say that they have found Nabataean writings in Colorado. Now... It's all that joke. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> so, of Colorado. It must have been in Boulder, right? Um, so it's it's a very they were very powerful people back then. There again, Nabatea. Here you get an idea as well. Nabatea goes all the way up here to the Decapolis, all the way up to the Sea of Galilee. At one point, they controlled almost all the way up to Damascus. So they were very significant power in their day. This is why the Nabatean kingdom was. Um, initially was all of this area in here and then later they got even further up these lines if you can see the lines here these are some of the trade routes you will notice they they were trading in Yemen and in Oman trading up through the desert they had trade routes that carried all over the Middle East up into Europe here's another uh, list of some of their trade routes and Petra became their capital city it was at the crossroads of several of these very important trade routes so they were trading into North Africa, throughout Egypt, up uh, further up into the Asia Minor, what we know as Turkey, over into uh, Asia. So they eventually carried not only spices, but they traded in silks, in metals, in ceramics, in you name it. They were responsible for sort of this part of the Silk Road and Spice Road kind of trade. Um, here, eventually, the Romans were very interested in what the Nabataeans were able to do. One of the reasons they were so successful in traveling in the desert is they were extraordinary hydrologists. Who can tell me what a hydrologist is? A water engineer. They managed to plant, to put hidden cisterns and reservoirs all along their trade routes in the desert and they had markers that they could find them but nobody else could there are stories about for instance general cambesis was traveling through the desert once to get to egypt to try to conquer egypt and they were traveling and they're running out of water and they're you know they're about to die here a caravan of nabataeans show up on their camels with all of this water which they are able to sell at that point as you can imagine at a huge price they sell the water, and Cambesis and his, his guys are saying, where is the water? Where is the water? Where did you get this? They go, oh, uh, no, uh, what, uh, no hable glaze, you know. <laughs> and so they left. They waited a couple more days when Cambesis and his army are running out of water. 
Who shows up? The Nabataeans on their camels, and they sell more water, huge price. They had reservoirs planted across the desert. When you go to Petra, you'll be able to see some of the water engineering that they did around the city there. But you'll notice that this is uh, Arabia Petraea in Latin, or Arabia Nabataea. These were two areas. The Romans finally decided, we got to get control of this situation. But the Romans were smart. When Pompey came into this region in the first century BC, about 63 BC, he was conquering people all down through there. He conquered the Israelites and, and all of that. But when he got to the Nabataeans, they were so well known as traitors, he thought the smart thing to do is not conquer them, but simply tax them. Let them keep doing what they're doing, but may them pay, make them pay taxes. And so they had this agreement. They would pay tribute or tax to the Romans. They kept doing what they were doing, but the Romans kept trying to find out where is the water. And they would never tell. And they couldn't force them to tell. And so when the Romans took over, they renamed these areas. The area around Petra was called Arabia Petraea. And the larger area in the desert areas here was called um, Arabis Nabataei. And so the Romans were involved at that point, and they started to have an influence. There was a, a Roman influence and a Hellenistic influence, or Greek influence, on the sculpture and things. But nobody had really conquered them up to this point. The Romans let them keep doing what they were doing. They were illiterate people. They had their own alphabet. Unfortunately, we don't have any records of any, any real writings in terms of any books they wrote or, or histories or anything like that. Anything they would have written like that would have been on either leather or parchment, which does not last. It rots. But we know that language, and we know what the alphabet was because of carvings on rocks. Remember, they were big on carving rocks. So particularly, we have all these accounts of donations that were made by people. They were wealthy traders. And they gave a lot of money in honor of their gods. And so, I mean, how many of you all have art museums back in your hometowns where they have this, this marble wall where they carve all the names of people who donated to the museum, right? That's very much what the Nabataeans did. We have all these accounts where people's names and the amount of money they gave in honor of their gods or to build a new worship place or whatever are. So we know that they were literate. We have accounts of their writing as far away as China, and as I say, some people say even in Colorado. Uh, but the, this here is the language of Aramaic. Aramaic was uh, a version of Chaldean, which was the ancient Babylonian language. The reason if you read the New Testament that Jesus and a lot of the people spoke Aramaic every day is because the Israelites, prior to Jesus' time, had spent time in captivity in, ba in Babylon for 50, 60 years. And they had learned to speak Chaldean, which is the same as Aramaic. It's a, it's a revision of Aramaic. So you've got Aramaic here. You've got Arabic here, which was developed from that. They've now determined that Nabataean appears to have been an intermediate language between ancient Babylonian, or Aramaic, Chaldean, and Arabic, which comes later. So it was a transition language. Um, we do have an alphabet, so we are able to interpret all of that. So they were illiterate people. We just don't have any records of anything other than stone carvings. One of the reasons that they know that they had to write on other things is you'll notice that their letters are, most of them are curved. If you're carving, if everything, all of your writing is going to be carved on stone, what kind of letters would you create? Straight. Straight letters. Not like these. Um, it would be something more like cuneiform, which is done in clay. But something that, <clears throat> that requires curving like this indicates excuse me, that their language was written on something other than just stone, but we just have the stone inscriptions. Now, I said that they gave a lot of money to their gods. Um, they had a whole um, panoply of gods. They, they had a uh, pantheon of various gods in almost all of the ancient religions, and I'm going to do a talk on faith and culture in the ancient Near East, and they the people would tend to, to have gods that were based around natural phenomena in the primitive religions, the polytheistic religions. Usually the number one god would be the sky god. It might be the sun, or it might be thunder god, but it would be the, the god that they had a sense of power. Prior to amplification, electric amplification, what was the loudest noise anybody ever heard? Thunder, which is why thunder gods were always 
very powerful in ancient religions because this awesome noise that nobody can imagine a noise that loud. Well, they had, the Nabataeans had a god named Dushara, who was called the god of the mountains, but he was also the god of the sky. Um, they had, and the second god usually, or deity, that they usually have in primitive religions, is the fertility god. Well, why fertility god? And again, I'm going to talk about this in detail when we talk about ancient faith and, uh, faith and cultures uh, in the ancient Near East. Fertility god was because fertility means you have children. You don't have children, the tribe dies out. Fertility means your crops are growing. If the crops don't grow, everybody dies out. And so fertility was one of the major gods as well. Um, we've discovered, you'll notice that this is a square block with a face on it. The face actually came later. The um, Nabataeans, you will see this kind of thing both on the end, as you walk down to the entrance to seek into the, um, uh, into, uh, the city as we get there in, in to Petra. You will see niches carved out and there will be just square blocks in there. Those blocks represent their gods. It was only later that they started sort of humanizing them a little bit, but typically you will see niches with just stone blocks set in them. In fact, there were places, and this is at Petra and elsewhere that the Nabataeans lived, that they would do these, they're called god blocks. Now the interesting thing about these, the way they made them is the mountaintop used to be up here. They carved away everything around it to leave these stone columns. They're, they're called god blocks. And they disappear when you least want them to. Um, so they would carve down and leave these pillars. They're sometimes called bales or god blocks or gin blocks. D-J-I-N. Um, Again, you will see niches with these stone columns in them. Sometimes they will be like this, which is a version of this kind of thing, except in relief. Now, later on, when they were influenced by the Romans and the Greeks, they began to take the same gods and make them look more human. Most of the ancient religions would make their gods look like people. The Egyptian gods basically look like people, sometimes with animal heads. The Roman and Greek gods all were personified so that they looked like people. So later on, they took the god Dushara, and under the influence of the Greeks and Romans, they made him look like that. So they made him look like a person later, but initially they were just blocks. So as you're in Petra, as you're walking down to Petra even, look at the square blocks and the sort of conical almost um, uh, blocks that you see going in and recognize those were places of worship. Those niches, in where we live in Mexico, that might have a statue of, of the Virgin de Guadalupe in it, but it's the same idea, okay? They didn't, however, lack the ability to do representational art. While their gods were represented by blocks, and by the way, a lot of the historians, the Greeks and the Romans who went there, made big deals out of the fact that they worship blocks of stone. But they were able to do representational art, you know, people's faces, these are votive figures. These are worshipers that they would have used uh, to represent their worship. This is hard to see, but it's a really beautifully carved eagle. Um, they had their own coinage. And they also did decorative arts like earrings. So they were quite artistic as well. But the thing that set them apart, the thing that truly made them great was their water engineering. They had the ability to find water when nobody else could, to store water in places where nobody else could store water, to grow crops where nobody could grow crops. This actually is along the Sik, the, the Sik S-I-Q is the canyon that you go into Petra. This is along, and you'll see these, these uh, channels on either side as you go into the city. Um, you'll see places where there are canyons that lead, small canyons that lead into the sea. They would capture the water when they would have rainstorms, and they do have rainstorms, but not often. It's a very dry area. It was not quite as dry 2,000 years ago as it is today. Um, and I should say that the, the Nabataeans existed between about 500 BC and 580. It's about 1,000 years, but their real high point of their civilization, when they really, and it's when they were creating much of this, was really only about 200 years, from about 100 BC to 100 AD. And so that 200-year um, that period, 
100 BC to 100 AD is when much of this kind of thing happened. And so they created ways to capture water when they did have the, the, the infrequent rainstorms and feed it into these troughs. They also developed reservoirs. They had the ability to create absolutely uh, 90 degree corners so that they had cubicle reservoirs that they could seal over. They also invented a waterproof cement so that they could glaze the insides of the re these reservoirs and the water wouldn't leak out. You see there's water in here? There's still water in these reservoirs. Okay, it has the concrete hasn't decayed. This is 2,000 years old. The, the concrete hasn't decayed. The Romans also developed a waterproof concrete that they just, less than a year ago, they finally figured out how they did it. Did you hear about that? And now they're saying that they should be able to create a concrete that's much longer lasting and is a lot less damaging to the environment than creating Portland concrete. Well, the Nabataeans did the same thing, and they would bury these cisterns and cover them over. You get an example here. Underneath, this is actually in Petra, underneath some of the houses and tombs and stuff, you will see places that were water cisterns. They would direct the water in there, seal it off, and access it when they needed to. I told you that they crossed the desert and would show up with water when nobody else had any. They are uncovering, and you'll notice, this is out in the middle of the desert. They are uncovering now cisterns and various reservoirs that the Nabataeans created. Usually what they would do is in a stone area, they would cut down into the stone and all of this would be carved out. So they didn't have to put a cover over it. it was, the stone was there. They would fill it with water from runoff uh, when it rained and then seal it up and they would have markers that other people didn't wouldn't see or couldn't read and they would know where the reservoirs were so they could always get water in the middle of the desert that enabled them to be traders in areas that nobody else could even travel and survive in um, they also did agriculture one of the things they would do for instance in areas where it might only rain once or twice a year is they would cut out a very shallow funnel dig down in the middle of it and put less, you know, soil, uh, L-O-E-S-S, and one fruit tree, perhaps. When it rained, the water would run down this, this shallow funnel, soak the soil, and then the soil would sort of seal the water in, and with just one or two rains a year, they would produce fruit off of this tree. They did that sort of thing in a lot of different areas, so they were able to grow their own food. They traded a lot for food as well, but they were able to survive. So we are landing here at uh, Ahaba. Petra is here. Petra is about 50 miles south of the Dead Sea, to give you a perspective. And there is a, the from the Sea of Galilee, actually further north than that, but the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea, and then what's called the Wadi Araba, which is a, a wadi is, in, is a canyon, that runs down, and Petra is near the Wadi Araba, down to the Gulf of Aqaba. This is all the Great Rift Valley. From here, it goes down through the Red Sea and into Africa. Have any of you all been to Kenya and seen the Great Rift Valley? Yes. If you go to Kenya and you drive south from Nairobi, you're driving along, and all of a sudden you come to this precipice, and you're looking out over this huge plain, and it just drops off sheer. That's the effect of the Great Rift Valley. Well, all of this is part of that. Um, this is the northern part of the Great Rift Valley. So we'll be going here to Petra. For those of you who are going to Wadi Rum, that's in this area down here, okay? But there's Petra. Now, when you get to the city of Petra, this says local accommodation. There is parking up in here for where our buses will be. You come down the street, there is a visitor center there, and it's a little square. There is a museum there that is not very big. You can, 15 minutes, you can go through the whole thing, I think. And um, it's got some interesting displays and pictures and images and things like that of how the Nabataeans, uh, what they did and how they did it. And there's also shopping there. If you didn't get to shop today in Horgata, there are little stalls there that you can buy beautiful scarves and all kinds of things. Not, not a lot, a dozen maybe. From there, from the visitor center, you will walk down here and you'll walk, actually you come this way, and you'll walk past some of the tombs, the gin blocks I mentioned, you can see them on both sides. This is, 
is, is fairly level. It's not steep up or down, but it's kind of a fine gravelly kind of path, walkway. And so uh, but be aware of that. You'll walk down about half the distance, you'll get to the, uh, to the seek, Al Seek, and you will walk through this canyon. The canyon in places is um, very, very high. It's like 20 feet wide in some places. Some places it almost touches at the top. Beautiful stone, all of this. In, in ages past has been worn out by water. You know, it's a, a natural water ravine. So you'll go through there, and this is the image that, I think it was the, Indiana Jones was at the Temple of Doom or the Last Crusade? That, Last uh, Crusade. Last Crusade, they ride their horses through, this extraordinary stone, that's it. You will come out of the seek right here and right in front of you, in fact, you'll see it as you come around the corner in the seek, is Al, the um, Alakazne, which is called the treasury. It's not a treasury. It was a tomb. We believe it was a tomb for one of the primary kings they had. Again, it's 128 feet high and eight, over 80 feet wide. Um, and the carvings on it, there are very rich Greek, Greek images. Uh, the Castor and Pollux, two of the Roman gods, are carved onto it. Um, there's all sorts of things like that. You will see that, and there's sort of a big area here, and there'll be people there selling stuff, and camels and horses, and they'll all be wanting you to, to take a ride. By the way, in Arabic, uh, thank you is shakron. Shakron. No thank you, more important than that, is la shakron. Okay? So if somebody's offering you something you're not interested, you know, you can say it in Arabic now, la shakron. Uh, the, from there, you mostly go to the right, there is a amphitheater down here, which is a Roman style amphitheater. And when you look at it, it will be different than any other amphitheater you've seen because most amphitheaters, they take blocks, cut the blocks and they set them in place to make the benches and you know whatnot. This is all carved out of the raw rock. There's no building of anything in, in Petra. It's all carved from, from in situ, as they would say, you know, from the stuff that was there. As you follow on around, on the right-hand side, there's a series of royal um, tombs. You come down here, and the walkway goes down this way. The Grand Temple is over on your left, up on top of a, a low hill, was where a Christian church was. If you walk up there, they have uh, some fascinating mosaics from the Christian time. And you walk on down, there is a museum down here. The restaurant where we'll be eating is right down here. If we have time and you're interested, you can walk up the hill, up on top of the mountain, to the monastery, Al Dair, which is the biggest of the buildings. Um, I'll, I'll show you a couple more images here in a second. It's about 900 steps up there. It's not horrendously steep, but don't do it if you're not used to walking. I mean, we've done it and it wasn't a problem, but uh, make sure that you're ready for it. There are other places up on top of the mountain, the sacrificial place and others that you can go to. It is a huge area. You will not see it all. We've been there twice, spent two days there. We have not seen it all. Okay. Al Dair, the monastery, Al Kazne, the treasury, the first thing you'll see when you come through the seat. Make sure as you walk from the visitor center down, you're looking at various of the blocks on the left and right. There are tombs there, and you'll see some of these gin blocks that uh, represent their deities. This is a more simplified version from the visitor centers through the seek, which is through the mountain here, uh, the treasury, the street of facades, the theater I mentioned, the royal tombs, Colonnade Street, and then uh, museum, and then up on top of the mountain is the monastery, Al Dair. This is what the seek looks like. And again, somebody today said something about, oh, well, I'm claustrophobic, I don't want to get in that. You don't have to squeeze through this. At, at its narrowest place, it's six or eight feet. You okay? Yeah, I'm trying to see. Okay. Oh, I see. It's getting excited. I didn't know. Um, it, it, there's no sense of claustrophobia in here, but they have uh, they drive horse and buggy through here, so it's not anything. You don't have to be a mountain climber to get through the sea, but uh, you get. It's usually about this wide, and you will notice on both sides, uh, in various places, the channels that they use to collect water. And it's fascinating. They have places where it's covered over to keep dust and dirt and stuff out. There are other places where as the water's running along in the channel, they will have cut a box out below it. And those are filters because the water would be flowing across this if there's any sediment or rock or anything like that. It would fall down in those areas and the clean water would pass on over. 
So just brilliant uh, engineering on this. Again, uh, more. See, they drive these kind of buggies in there, and you can you can hire a horse and buggy, but do understand these things go like a bat out of hell. I mean, they <laughs> they really run fast and hard, and you see people bouncing like crazy. So if you've got <laughs> kidney problems or bad back, I don't recommend that to you. But maybe you want to experience it. They will have horses also, and uh, I was told the horses are included. If you want to take it, they'll expect you to give them a tip at the end. But uh, you may not want to, you can walk. It is a, a fairly flat walk. It's a little bit of a ways. It's probably a kilometer or so total. I think it's a half a kilometer through the seat and a half a kilometer getting up to it. Something like, is that about right? Um, are our guys in here? No, I don't see them. This is the treasury, al Kazne. when you come out. These are people down here. It gives you some idea of the scale of this thing. They call it the treasury because for many, many years, the Bedouins thought there was treasure hidden in this. In fact, if you could get up here, this, uh, the, the top, the urn at the top of this central carving is full of bullet pockmarks because they kept thinking if they could shoot this and break it, that's where the treasure was kept. But uh, you cannot go inside because so many people were going inside over the years, they were wearing out the stone floor. Um, this is not a hard heart, it's a sandstone that it'll wear out. And so nobody's allowed to go in this one anymore. You can go in the monastery if you walk up at the top of the hill. To, and some of the others you can enter as well. But lots of carvings, as I say, of Greek and Roman motifs. Uh, rosettes, which represent royalty, which is why we believe this was a royal tomb. This is another image of the same thing. That's where the bullet pockmarks are. And again, can you see? These are people right here. It's 128 feet tall. Uh, more images. These are some of the tombs. When they put in the, um, the amphitheater, they cut away the front of some of the tombs. And so you'll be able to see some of the tombs that they had. This is taken from inside one of the areas that probably would have been a house at one point. That's natural erosion. Look inside some of these as you're walking down through here because there's glorious colors. Reds and yellows. It's just really beautiful stone. Some of the very significant large tombs. This is um, Al Dair, the monastery up on top of the mountain. You can go inside there, it's just one chamber inside. These are some of the royal tombs on your right as you go around, and you can walk up to those. It's not that hard to get up to it, but you do have to walk up to them. More of the royal tombs. These are some of the older, you'll notice they're just square blocks, some of the older tombs that they had before they started putting in a lot of the Roman and Greek influence. And here, this is on the walkway from the visitor center down to Al Sikh, and you'll notice the gin blocks, the, the carvings that represented for them their deities. Various other kind of dwelling places. Now, this fellow is on top of Al Dair. This is just, okay, let me um, go back here for a second. You see right there, where I'm pointing right now, that's him. Better him than me. Yeah. You know, um, at the top of this thing. Here are some of the mosaics when they were first uncovering them and cleaning them as part of the church, the Christian church that's on your right as you walk down toward the museum. And again, the final image of Al Kazne. If you haven't been here, I do strongly recommend you go. If you're not going to go to this, I strongly recommend that you uh, get to the Wadi Rum, which is a natural, extraordinary natural place where there are canyons, a lot of the same sort of uh, rock areas, but it is just awe-inspiring in terms of the kind of scenery that you will get there. Uh, this is not the day to stay on the boat. If you are absolutely addicted to snorkeling or diving and you want to do that, as I said, we forgive you. But uh, it's you can't, you'll never experience anything quite like this again, believe me. Questions about any of that? You're first? What happened to the Nabataeans? What happened to the Nabataeans? Well, over a period of time, the Romans eventually um, began to be more oppressive. And finally, one of the kings, the last official king of the Nabataeans, said to the Roman, uh, the local Roman authorities, if you will leave us alone until I die, I will give you the city of Petra, all right? And he deeded it to them. 
So they sort of occupied it for a while, but they still didn't know about, you know, they still couldn't control all the trade routes because they didn't have access to the water. Eventually, somewhere around 500 AD, for reasons that we do not know, the Nabataeans abandoned Petra. They didn't do it, as is often the case when they abandon a place, because of a natural disaster, there's no indication of that, or because of starvation or whatever. It seemed to have been an orderly departure over a period of time. They didn't leave, you know, dishes on the, you know, in the sink or, or coins laying around or whatever. The sort of thing that would indicate that, that uh, people left quickly. Over a period of time, they simply abandoned it. Eventually, they kind of melted away. And so there is no sense in which there is a distinct Nabataean people anymore. Um, so first they lost the city to the Romans. They were still living there, but the Romans were controlling it. Eventually they left. And the Nabataeans, you know, they intermarried. They stopped having a distinct culture. And no more Nabataeans. Uh, yes? Do we know how they were able to carve that high at that height? So how were they able to carve at that height? There are... Um, up here, and I only know this because a guy told me this, I didn't climb up here. There are along the side, well in fact you see these these pockmarks here? I saw those. Yeah, apparently what they did was they would start at the top and they would anchor supports on either side and they would start carving from the top and carve, carve, carve all the way down and as they moved down they would move to other anchor points for whatever support they were using, ropes or you know beams or something. And as they got down, whenever they're you know carving in, and when they get down to the bottom to carve out the chamber, they just dig in deeper. And so there's indication along some of these, as you can see there, that there were support points that they used, and they carved from the top down. People have asked, asked, well, where did they put all the all the debris? Over on the sides, to the left, and then down around through some of the other canyons and things, there's enormous piles of stone. You know, it's a very rugged, dry. Um, area and so any they could have they could have dumped any amount of stone that they taken up from the carvings in those areas and you wouldn't be able to tell because there's a lot of stone there anyway other questions here well um, I'm not exactly sure um, Mount Hoare it's a traditional location they don't know for sure that this was Mount Hoare but the belief is that, with, like when you're standing here in Petra, it would be over and back on the mountainside to the left. Again, the idea was that Aaron, the brother of Moses, was buried there, and so that's how Burkhart got in in order to do a to offer a sacrifice at the tomb of, of Aaron. So they believe that Mount Hor was back behind this. There are ridges of mountains all through this area. It's very rough, but I don't know exactly where it is. Over here, yes. Any kind of what? Goddess culture. So what about their deities and did they have any sense of a goddess culture? The answer is yes. They had a whole um, a whole group of deities. Their number one deity, Dushar, the god of the mountains, was also the god of the sky, which they related. The second uh, uh, primary deity they had was Alat, who was a female uh, goddess, who was the goddess of fertility. And so, and then they had a third who was the god of the moon. I mentioned before that moon, the moon is frequently as important or more important in a lot of cultures than the sun because you can look at the moon. You know, you can focus on it, you can see features on it. So those three, you may have noticed when I was showing you the god blocks in one of the niches, there were three square blocks. Those represented Dushar, um, Alat, and then the moon god, whose name I'm not remembering right now, was a male, which is unusual. Usually the moon gods are goddesses. But they did have a whole, um, you know, a whole polytheistic panoply of gods, a pantheon. And so, but the three primary ones were the male uh, mountain god, the female fertility god, a lot, and then the moon god. Okay? Yes? This building, as you said, was incorrectly labeled the treasury. The monastery at the top, what all was that used for? Well, the monastery at the top, they, these are just traditional things, you know, this, this was, a, there's three chambers in there, and we believe it was one of their primary kings because he had two wives. The monastery at the top, so the question is, what was it used for? They, the monastery, whatever the original intention was, it was later used as a church. In fact, if you go inside the monastery, a Christian church, if you go inside the monastery, then there is a, an area in the back that was hollowed out to use as kind of an altar. And so they did have 
uh, worship services there. And uh, whether they had previous to Christ the Christian phase or not, but they did have Christian worship services. Now, this is 900 steps up on top of a mountain. We can't get people to come to church if it's sprinkling rain. <laughs> and yet, they, apparently, people were coming up this mountain in order to, to go to, to services inside Aldair, the monastery. And so that's why it got that name. Mostly, these names are, are misnomers, but they're just the tradition. That's how things get labeled. Okay. Any other questions? No? Oh, yes. Did they use slave labor for the construction of the buildings? No. The, the Nabataeans had no slaves. Early on, they were quite peaceful. That's why they didn't want to settle down, is because they didn't feel like they were ready to, to fight anybody off. They, because it was a very egalitarian society. Everybody worked. Everybody was fairly equal. They did have kings, but not to the extent that, you know, they, they but there's, uh, the indication is they did not have any slave labor. They later on developed a military capability, but then once the Romans came in, after Pompey, because of the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, the Romans were responsible for maintaining the peace, and they completely lost any martial abilities, in other words, any military kind of abilities. So, but we know they didn't have slaves. This work was done by, by the people who lived there. Um, anything else? Well. Tonight we motor, tomorrow we land at Aqaba, and you, whatever you do, may you have a wonderful day.